The Chronicle of Peru by Pedro Cieza de Leon, a Spanish conquistador and chronicler who lived from 1520 to 1554. Translated to English by Clements R. Marca for the Hacklet Society of London in England. Chapter 21. Of the Indians of Pozo, and how valiant they are, and how dreaded by the neighboring tribes. There were three chiefs in this province when we entered it with the captain Jorge Robledo. These, with their followers, were and are the most valiant and bold Indians in all these provinces. Their territory is bounded on one side by the great river, on another by the provinces of Carapa and Picara, concerning which I will speak presently, and on a third by Pacura, of which I have already treated. These Indians of Pozo are not on friendly terms with any of their neighbors. Their origin is derived, according to their own account, from certain Indians who in ancient times came from the province of Arma, and, seeing how fertile the soil of this country of Pozo was, settled there. Their language and customs are the same as those of Arma. The chiefs have very large and lofty circular houses, and ten or fifteen persons live in them, according to the number of the family. At the doors of the houses there are great palisades and other defences, made of stout canes, between which there are large boards covered with reeds, so that none of the mounted Spaniards could pass them. From the summit of the table land these Indians watched all the roads to see who was coming. The men are better disposed than those of Arma, and the women are large and ugly, although there are some who are pretty. But in truth I saw very few such. Within the houses of the chiefs, near the entrances, there was a row of idols, about fifteen or twenty in number, and each the size of a man. Their faces were made of wax, and moulded into the form and shape of that of the devil. They say that sometimes, when they called him, the devil entered into the bodies of these wooden idols, and answered them from within. The heads are like the skulls of corpses. When the chiefs die they bury them within the houses, in great sepulchres, and place by the bodies great vases of wine made from maize, with their arms and gold, and the ornaments they valued most. They also bury many women alive with them, according to the manner of those tribes whose countries we had already passed through. I remember that, in the province of Arma, the second time that Captain Jorge Robledo passed through it, we went, by his order, one Antonio Pimentel and myself, to examine a burial place in the village of a chief named Yeo, in which we found more than two hundred small pieces of gold, which in that country they call shagnalatas, but as a horrible smell came from the bodies, we went away without getting all that was there. If all the gold that is buried in Peru, and in these countries, was collected, it would be impossible to count it, so great would be the quantity, and the Spaniards have yet got little compared with what remains. When I was in Cusco, receiving an account of the Incas from the principal natives, I heard it said by Paulo Inca and others, that if all the treasure in the Huacas, which are their burial places, was collected together, that which the Spaniards had already taken would look very small, and they compared it to a drop taken out of a great vase of water. In order to make the comparison more striking, they took a large measure of maize, and, dropping one grain out of it, they said, the Christians have found that, the rest is so concealed, that we ourselves do not know the place of it. So vast are the treasures that are lost in these parts. If the Spaniards had not come, all the gold in the country would certainly have been offered to the devil, or buried with the dead, for the Indians neither want it, nor seek it for any other purpose. They do not pay any wages with it to their men of war, nor do they want it except as ornaments when alive, and to be placed by their sides when dead. Therefore, it seems to me that we are bound to bring them to a knowledge of our holy Catholic faith, without showing them that our only wish is to fill our pockets. These Indians and their women go naked like all the rest. They are very laborious, and when they sow or dig the land, they hold the club for hoeing in one hand, and the lance for fighting in the other. The chiefs are more respected by the Indians than in other parts. The sons inherit the chieftainship, and in their default the nephews. The province of Picara is distant two leagues, that of Pakura a league and a half, and that of Carapa about the same. All these provinces had three times as many Indians, yet the Indians of Pozo waged cruel war upon them one after the other, and all feared them and desired their friendship. A large body went forth from their villages, leaving sufficient for their defence, and carried many musical instruments, such as drums and flutes. Thus they marched against their enemies, taking cords with them to bind their prisoners. Arriving at the place where the enemy awaited them, they set up loud shouts, and closed upon them, killing, taking prisoners, and burning houses. In all these wars the Indians of Pozo were always the most valiant, and so their neighbours confess. But they are as great butchers in eating human food as those of Arma, for one day I saw them eat more than a hundred men and women whom they had taken in war. They marched with us, when the Adelantado Don Sebastian de Balalcazar was subduing the provinces of Picara and Pacura, which had rebelled, and at that time the name of the chief of this town of Pozo was Periquito. In the inroads which we made, these Indians of Pozo killed the other Indians as if they were rabbits, and hunted out those who were concealed near the banks of the river, without letting one escape.
one Rodrigo Alonso, I, and two other Christians, being in the province of Pakura, went in chase of certain Indians, and on entering a village there came out the freshest and prettiest Indian girl I have ever seen in all these provinces. When we saw her we called her, but as soon as she heard us, she shrieked as if she had seen the devil, and ran towards the Indians of Pozo, thinking it better to be killed and eaten by them than to fall into our hands. And so it was that one of those Indians, who were our allies, before we could prevent him, gave her a cruel blow on her head, while another came up and beheaded her with a stone knife. The girl, when they approached her, knelt down and awaited her doom, which they gave her. They then drank her blood, and ate her heart and entrails raw, carrying off the head and limbs to eat on the following night. I saw two other Indians, who killed those of Pakura, and the victims laughed pleasantly, just as if they had not been the men who were to die. In fine, all the Indians of these parts have the custom of eating human flesh. The Indians of Pozo are very rich in gold, and near their village there are mines on the banks of the great river which passes near. In this place the Adelantado Don Sebastian de Bilal Cazar and his captain and lieutenant general Francisco Hernandez Giron captured the marshal Don Jorge Robledo, and cut off his head, besides putting others to death. And that they might not have to carry the bodies of the marshal and the others to Arma, the Indians ate them. Nevertheless they burnt a house over the remains of the bodies. Chapter 22. Of the province of Picara, and of the chiefs of it. Leaving Pozo, and travelling to the eastward, the great and very populous province of Picara is reached. The names of the principal chiefs of this province, when we discovered it, were Picara, Chuscruqua, Sanguatama, Chamberica, Ancora, Apirami, and others. Their language and customs resemble those of Pakura. This province extends to certain mountains which give rise to rivers of very limpid and sweet water. The rivers are said to be rich in gold. The country is broken up into rugged mountains, like that which we had already passed, but it is so populous that all the hills and valleys are under cultivation, in so much that the sight of so many crops causes pleasure and contentment. In all parts there are plantations of fruit trees. The people have few houses, because they have been burnt in their wars. The province contained more than ten or twelve thousand Indians capable of bearing arms when we first entered it, and they go naked, for neither they nor their women wear more than a small cloth between the legs, and in all other matters, whether of eating, drinking, or marrying, they have the same customs as those whom we had already seen. Thus, when the chiefs die, their bodies are placed in large and deep tombs, accompanied by many live women, and adorned by all they possessed of most value when living, according to the general custom of the other Indians of these parts. At the entrances of the houses of the caciques there are small platforms surrounded by stout canes, on the tops of which are stuck the heads of their enemies, and this is a horrid thing to see, as there are many of them, looking fierce with long hair, and their faces painted in such sort as to appear like those of devils. In the lower part of the canes there are holes through which the wind can pass, and when it blows, there is a noise which sounds like the music of devils. Nor is human flesh distasteful to these Indians, any more than to those of Pozo, for when we first entered their country with the captain Don Jorge Robledo, more than four thousand of these natives of Picara marched with us, and killed and ate as many as three hundred hostile Indians. They affirm that, on the other side of the mountains to the eastward of this province, which are the cordilleras of the Andes, there is a great, rich, and populous valley called Arby. I do not know whether it has been discovered, nor did I hear more than this rumour concerning it. The Indians of Picara have great stakes, as sharp as if they were of iron, made of a black palm wood, which they fix in holes along the roads, and subtly cover with straw and grass. When they are at war with the Spaniards they fix so many of these stakes that it is very troublesome to get through the country, and many soldiers have been staked in the legs and feet. Some of these Indians have bows and arrows, but they are not dexterous in their use, and do little harm with them. They have slings with which they throw stones with great force. The men are of middle height, the women the same, and some of them good-looking. Leaving this province, in the direction of the city of Cartago, we next came to the province of Carapa, which is not very distant, and is rich and populous. Chapter 23. Of the province of Carapa, and of what there is to be said concerning it. The province of Carapa is twelve leagues from the city of Cartago, situated in a very rugged mountainous country, and the Cordillera of the Andes rises above it. The houses of the natives are small and very low, made of canes, and thatched with other small and delicate canes, of which there are many in these parts. Some of the houses of the chiefs are large, but others not. When the Christian Spaniards first entered the country there were five of these chiefs. The principal amongst them was called Yerua, who, in former years, had entered the country by force, and ruled over all men like a powerful tyrant. Among the mountains there are some little valleys and open spaces well watered by numerous rivers and springs, but the water is not so wholesome as that of the rivers we had passed. The men are very large, with long visages, and the women are robust. 
These people are very rich in gold, for they had very large pieces, and beautiful vases, out of which they drank their wine made of maize. Those who drink this liquor soon lose their senses, yet the Indians are so vicious that they will sometimes drink an aroba at one sitting, not at one draught, but by taking many pulls. Their bellies being full of this beverage, it provokes vomiting, and they throw up as much as they like. Many of them hold the cup out of which to drink in one hand, and they are not great eaters, but all the Indians we met with are generally addicted to excessive drinking. When a chief dies without children, his principal wife succeeds, and when she dies the nephew of the deceased chief inherits, if he is the son of a sister. They have no temples nor houses of worship, but the devil talks to some of them occasionally, as he does with Indians of other tribes. They bury their dead within their houses, in great vaults, accompanied by living women, food, and many valuables possessed by the deceased, as is the custom with their neighbors. When any of these Indians feel ill, they make great sacrifices for their health in the manner which they have learnt from their ancestors, all in honor of the accursed devil. He, God permitting it, lets them know that all things are in his hands, and that he is superior to all others. Not, but that they are aware of a God, sole creator of the whole world, for the Almighty does not permit the devil to assume this dignity, from which he is so widely separated. Yet they believe many evil things, although I learned from themselves that they are sometimes at issue with the devil, when they hate him, and see through his lies and falseness. For their sins, however, they are so subject to his will that they are unable to escape from the prisons of deceitfulness. They are blind, like other Gentile people of more knowledge and understanding, until the light of the sacred evangelist's words enters into their hearts. The Christians who settle in these Indies should never fail to instruct the natives in true doctrine, otherwise I know not how they will fare when they and the Indians appear before the divine throne, on the day of judgment. The principal chiefs marry their nieces, and sometimes their sisters, and they have many wives. They eat the Indians whom they capture, like all the other tribes. When they go to war, they wear very rich pieces of gold, with great crowns, and large bracelets of gold on their wrists. Great and valuable banners are carried before them. I saw one which was given as a present to the Captain Don Jorge Robledo, the first time we entered this province, which weighed upwards of 3,000 pesos, and a golden vase worth 290 pesos, besides two other loads of this metal, consisting of ornaments of many shapes. The banner was a long narrow cloth fastened to a wand, and covered with small pieces of gold to imitate stars. In this province there are also many fruit trees, and some deer, guadaquinajes, and other game, besides many edible roots. Leaving this province, we came to that of Quinbaya, in which the city of Cartago is situated. Cartago is twenty-two leagues from the town of Arma. Between the province of Carapa and that of Quinbaya, there is a very large and desert valley, of which the tyrant I have just spoken of was Lord, he whose name was Urua, and who ruled in Carapa. The war between him and the natives of Quinbaya was very fierce, and he also forced many in Carapa to leave their country when he took possession of it. It is rumored that there are great sepulchres in this valley, of chiefs who are buried there. Chapter 24. Of the province of Quinbaya, and of the customs of the chiefs. Also, concerning the foundation of the city of Cartago, and who was its founder. The province of Quinbaya is fifteen leagues long by ten broad, from the Rio Grande to the snowy mountains of the Andes. It is populous throughout its whole extent, and the country is not so rugged as that through which we had passed. It contains extensive and dense cane breaks, which cannot be penetrated without great labor, and this province, with its rivers, is full of these cane breaks. In no part of the Indies have I seen or heard of any place where there are so many canes as in this province, but it pleased God, our Lord, that this country should have a superabundance of canes, that the people might not have much trouble in making their houses. The snowy mountains, which are a part of the great chain of the Andes, are seven leagues from the villages of this province. In the highest parts of them there is a volcano which, on a clear day, may be seen to send forth great quantities of smoke, and many rivers rise in these mountains, which irrigate the land. The chief rivers are the Takurumbi, the Sig, which passes close to the city, and there are many others which cannot be counted for number. When the freshes come down in the winter season, the Indians have bridges of canes fastened together with reeds, and strongly secured to trees on either side. All the rivers are very full of gold. When I was there in the year 1547 they got more than 15,000 pesos worth in three months, and the largest gang of laborers consists of three or four Negroes and some Indians. Valleys are formed along the courses of the rivers, and though the banks are densely lined with canes, there are many fruit trees of the country, and large plantations of pixiuere palms. In these rivers there are fountains of healing water, and it is a marvelous thing to see their manner of rising in the midst of the rivers, for which thanks be to God our Lord. Further on I will devote a chapter to these fountains, for it is a matter well worthy of note. The men of this province are well disposed, 
and of good countenances, the women the same, and very amorous. Their houses are small, and roofed with the leaves of canes. There are now many fruit trees and other plants which the Spaniards cultivate, both from Spain, and of the country. The chiefs are very liberal, they have many wives, and are all friendly, and in alliance with each other. They do not eat human flesh, except on very great occasions, and the chiefs alone were very rich in gold. Of all the things that were to be seen, the most notable were their jewels of gold and great vases out of which they drink their wine. I saw one, which a cacique named Takurumbi gave to the captain Don Jorge Robledo, which would contain two otzumbers, of water. The same cacique gave another to Miguel Munoz which was still larger and more valuable. The arms of these Indians are lances and darts, and certain estalicas, which they throw with great force, a mischievous weapon. They are intelligent and observant, and some of them are great magicians. They assemble to make feasts for their pleasure, and when they have drunk, a squadron of women is placed on one side, and another on the other, the men are placed in the same way, and they pass backwards and forwards, chanting the word potato body, potato body, which means we play. Thus, with darts and wands, the game begins, which ends in the wounding of many, and the death of some. They twist their hair into great wheels, and thus they wear it when they go to war. They have been a fierce and encroaching people, until justice was executed upon the old chiefs. When they assembled for their feasts and games in an open space, all the Indians gathered together, and two of them made a noise with drums. One then began to dance, and all the rest followed, each with his cup of wine in his hand, for they drank, danced, and sang all at the same time. Their songs consisted of a recitation of their deeds, and of the deeds of their ancestors. They have no creed, and they converse with the devil, like all the rest of the Indians. When they are ill they bathe many times, at which times they themselves relate that they see awful visions. And, in treating of this subject, I will here relate what happened in this province of Quinbaya in the year 1547. At the time when the viceroy, Blasco Nunez Vela, was embarrassed by the movements of Gonzalo Pizarro and his followers, a great pestilence spread over the whole kingdom of Peru, which began on the other side of Cusco, and pervaded the whole country. People without number died. The illness consisted of a headache accompanied by raging fever, and presently the pain passed from the head to the left ear, when it became so great that the patient did not last more than two or three days. The pestilence reached this province. Now there is a river, about half a league from the city of Cartago, called Consota, and near it there is a small lake where they make salt from the water of a spring. Many Indian women were one day assembled there, making salt for the households of their lords, when they saw a tall man with his belly open and bowels hanging out, holding two boys by the hand. When he came to the women, he said, I promise you that I have to kill all the women of the Christians, and all those of your people, and it shall be done presently. As it was daytime the Indian women showed no fear, but related the occurrence in a laughing way when they went to their homes. In another village of the neighborhood, called Geraldo Gilestapina, they saw the same figure on horseback, galloping over all the hills and mountains like the wind. In a few days the pestilence and earache came on in such a manner, that most of the people died, the Spaniards losing their Indians bound to service, so that few or none were left, in addition to which such terror prevailed that the very Spaniards seemed to be fearful and afraid. Many women and boys affirmed that they saw the dead with their own eyes walking again. These people well understand that there is something in man besides the mortal body, though they do not hold that it is a soul, but rather some kind of transfiguration. They also think that all bodies will rise again, but the devil has given them to understand that it will be in a place where there will be great ease and pleasure, and this is the reason that they place great quantities of wine and maize, fish, and other things in their sepulchres, together with the arms of the deceased, as if these could free him from the pains of hell. The custom among them is that the son succeeds the father, and, failing sons, the nephew being the son of a sister. In ancient times these Indians were not natives of Quinbaya, but they invaded the country many times, killing the inhabitants, who could not have been few, judging from the remains of their works, for all the dense cane breaks seem once to have been peopled and tilled, as well as the mountainous parts, where there are trees as big round as two bullocks. From these facts I conjecture that a very long period of time has elapsed since these Indians first peopled the Indies. The climate of the province is very salubrious, so that the Spaniards, who have settled in it, neither suffer from heat nor from cold. Chapter 25. In which the subject of the preceding chapter is continued, respecting what relates to the city of Cartago, and its foundation, and respecting the animal called Chucha. These cane breaks, of which I have already spoken, are so close and thick, that if a man is not well acquainted with the country, he would lose himself, and be unable to get out of them. Amongst the canes there are many tall sebas, with many wide-spreading branches, and other trees of different sorts which, as I do not know their names, I am unable to give them here. 
In the depths of these cane breaks there are great caves or cavities where bees make their hives, and make honeycombs which are as good as those of Spain. There are some bees which are little bigger than mosquitoes, and at the entrance of their hives, after they have been well closed, they insert a tube apparently of wax, and half a finger long, by which they enter to do their work, their little wings laden with what they have collected from the flowers. The honey of this kind of bees is a little sour, and they do not get more than a quartillo of honey from each hive. There is another species of bees, which are black and rather larger, those just mentioned being white. The opening which the black bees make to get into the tree, is of wax wrapped round with a mixture that becomes harder than stone. Their honey is, without comparison, better than that of the white bees, and each hive contains more than three otzumbers. There are other bees larger than those of Spain, but none of them sting. When, however, they take the hive, the bees surround the man who is cutting the tree down, and stick to his hair and beard. Of the large hives of the last named bees, there are some weighing half an aroba, and their honey is much the best of all. I got some of these, and I saw more taken by Pedro de Velasco, a settler at Cartago. Besides the above products, there is a fruit in this province called Camito, as large as a nectarine. It is black inside, and has some very small pips, and a milk which sticks so closely to the beard and hands that it takes some time to get it off. There is another fruit like very savory cherries, besides aguacatas, guavas, and guayabas, and some as sour as lemons, with a good smell and flavor. The cane breaks, being very dense, become the haunts of many animals. There are great lions, and an animal like a small fox, with a long tail and short feet of a gray color, and the head of a fox. I once saw one of these creatures which had seven young ones near it. Directly it was frightened, or heard a noise, it opened a bag which nature has placed on its belly, put its young inside, and fled so swiftly that I was astonished at its agility, being so small, and running so rapidly with such a weight. They call this creature chucha. There are also small and very poisonous serpents, many deer, and some rabbits, besides guataquinajes, which are a little larger than hares, and whose flesh is very good and savory. There are many other things to relate, but I desist because they would appear trifling. The city of Cartago is situated on a smooth plain, between two small streams, seven leagues from the great river of Santa Martha, and near another small stream, the water of which is drunk by the Spaniards. This river is always crossed by a bridge of those canes which I have already mentioned. The city has very difficult approaches on both sides, and bad roads, for in the winter time the mud is deep. It rains all the year round, and the lightning is great, thunderbolts sometimes falling. This city is so well guarded, that the inhabitants cannot easily be robbed. The founder of the city was the same Captain Don Jorge Robledo who peopled the others which we had passed, in the name of the Majesty of the Emperor Don Carlos, our Lord, the Adelantado Don Francisco Pizarro being governor of all these provinces, in the year of our Lord 1540. It is called Cartago, because all the settlers and conquerors who accompanied Robledo had set out from Carthagena, and this is the reason that this name was adopted. Now that I have arrived at this city of Cartago, I will go on to give an account of the great and spacious valley where the city of Cali is seated, and that of Papayan, towards which we journeyed through the cane breaks until we reached a plain traversed by a great river called La Vieja. This river is crossed with much difficulty in the winter time, it is four leagues from the city. After crossing the river in balsas and canoes, the two roads unite, one coming from Cartago, and the other from Anzerma. From Anzerma to Cali the distance is 50 leagues, and from Cartago to Cali a little more than 45 leagues. Chapter 26. Which touches upon the provinces in this great and beautiful valley, up to the city of Cali. From the city of Papayan this valley begins to spread out like a level plain between the chains of mountains, and is twelve leagues broad, more or less. In some parts it is narrower, and in others broader, and the river which flows through it becomes so narrow that neither boat, nor balsa, nor anything else can pass, by reason of the fury of the stream, and of the stones which come down in it. Boats are upset and go to the bottom and thus many Spaniards and Indians have been drowned and much merchandise lost, for the rapidity of the stream is such that they have no time to get on land. All this valley, from the city of Cali to these rapids, was formerly very populous, and covered with very large and beautiful villages, the houses being close together and of great size. These villages of Indians have wasted away and been destroyed by time and war, for, when the captain Don Sebastian de Balalcazar, who was the first captain to discover and conquer this valley, made his entry, the Indians were bent on war, and fought with the Spaniards many times to defend their land, and escape from slavery. Owing to these wars, and to the famine which arose on account of the seeds not having been sown, nearly all the Indians died. There was another reason which led to their rapid extermination. The Captain Balalcazar founded, in the midst of the Indian villages in this plain, the city of Cali, 
which he afterwards rebuilt on its present site. The natives were so determined not to hold any friendship with the Spaniards, believing their yoke to be heavy, that they would neither sow nor cultivate the land, and from this cause there was such scarcity that the greater part of the inhabitants died. When the Spaniards abandoned the first site, the hill tribes came down in great numbers, and, falling upon the unfortunates who were sick and dying of hunger, soon killed and ate all those who survived. These are the reasons why the people of this valley are so reduced that scarcely any are left. On one side of the river, towards the east, is the Cordillera of the Andes, and on the other side there is a larger and more beautiful valley called Neva, through which flows the other branch of the great river of Santa Martha. In the skirts of the mountains there are many villages of Indians of different nations and customs, who are very barbarous, and who all eat human flesh, which they hold to be very delicious. On the highest parts of the mountains there are some small valleys which form the province of Buga. The natives of these valleys are brave warriors, and they watched the Spaniards who came to their country, and killed Christoval de Ayala, without any fear. When he, of whom I have spoken, was killed, his goods were sold in the market at excessive prices. A sow was sold for 1,600 pesos, together with a small pig. Sucking pigs went for 500 pesos, and a Peruvian sheep, llama, for 280 pesos. I saw these sums paid to one Andres Gomez, now a citizen of Cartago, by Pedro Romero of Anzerma. The 1,600 pesos for the sow and the pig were paid by the Adelantado Don Sebastian de Balacazar, out of the goods of the Marshal Don Jorge Robledo. I even saw that very so eaten at a banquet which was given on the day we arrived at the city of Cali with video. Juan Pacheco, a conqueror who is now in Spain, bought a pig for 220 pesos, and knives were sold for 15 pesos. I heard Geronimo Luis Texelo say that, when he went on the expedition with the captain Miguel Munoz, which is known as that of La Vieja, he bought a shoemaker's knife for 30 pesos, and shoes went for 8 pesos of gold. A sheet of paper was sold in Cali for 30 pesos. I might relate other facts of this kind to the glory of the Spaniards, as showing how cheap they held money, for if they required anything they thought nothing of it. They bought pigs in the sow's belly, before they were born, for 100 pesos and more. I would now request the judicious reader to reflect on and wonder at what countries were discovered and settled between the year 1526 and the present year 1547, and, thinking upon this, he will see how great are the deserts of the discoverers and conquerors who have labored so greatly in this work, and what reason His Majesty has to give, thanks to those who passed through those labors, and served loyally without butchering the Indians. Those, however, who have been butchers are deserving of punishment, in my opinion. When this province was discovered they bought a horse for 300 or 400 pesos, and even now there are those who have not yet paid their old debts, and who, covered with wounds received in the service, are shut up in prison until they can pay the debts demanded by their creditors. On the other side of the Cordillera is the other valley which I have already mentioned, where the town of Neva was founded. Towards the west there are still more villages and Indians in the mountains, but I have already given the reason why those in the plains nearly all died. The villages of the mountains extend to the shores of the South Sea, and stretch away far to the south. Their houses, like those I described in Tatabe, are built on trees like granaries, they are large, and contain many inhabitants. The land of these Indians is very fertile and prolific, and well supplied with swine and tapers, and other game, such as turkeys, parrots, pheasants, and abundance of fish. The rivers are not poor in gold, indeed we can affirm that they are very rich in that metal. Near these villages flows the great river of Darien, very famous on account of the city which was founded near it. All these Indians also eat human flesh. Some of them use bows and arrows, and others staves, clubs, darts, and long lances. Towards the north of Cali there is another province, bordering on that of Anzerma, the natives of which are called Shankos. They are so big that they look like small giants, with broad shoulders, robust frames, and great strength. Their faces are large and heads narrow, for in this province, in that of Quinbaya, and in other parts of the Indies, when a baby is born, they force the head into the shape they may choose, thus some grow up without an occiput, others with a raised forehead, and others with a very long head. This is done when the child is just born, by means of certain small boards fastened with ligatures. The women are treated in the same way. The shankos, both men and women, go naked and barefooted, with only a cloth between the legs, made, not of cotton, but of bark, taken from a tree and made very fine and soft, about a yard long, and two palmos broad. They fight with great lances and darts, and occasionally they leave their province to wage war with their neighbors of Anzerma. When the Marshal Robledo entered Cartago for the last time, which he ought not to have done, that he might be received as the lieutenant of the Judge Miguel Diaz Armendariz, certain Spaniards were sent to guard the road between Anzerma and the city of Cali. 
these men encountered certain of these Shankos, who had come down to kill a Christian who was going to take some goats to Cali, and one or two of the Indians were killed. The Spaniards were astonished at their great size. In the hills and valleys which sweep down from the Cordillera to the westward, there are many Indian villages, extending to the vicinity of the city of Cali, and bordering on the district of the Barbacos. The natives have their villages scattered over the hills, the houses being grouped in tens and fifteens, sometimes more, sometimes less. They call these Indians Garonas, because, when the city of Cali was founded in the valley, they called the fish Garan, and these Indians came in laden with them, calling out, Garan. Garan. Not knowing their correct name, the Spaniards named them after the fish they carried, Garonas, just in the same way as they named the Indians of Anzerma after the salt, which in their language is Anzer. The houses of these Indians are large and round, and roofed with straw. They have few fruit trees, but plenty of gold of four or five quillates, though little of the finer sort. Some rivers of fresh water flow near their villages. Near the doors of their houses they keep, from motives of pride, many feet of the Indians whom they have killed, and many hands. They preserve the insides, that they may lose nothing, and hang them up in rows like sausages in great quantities, and the heads and entire quarters are also kept. When we came to these villages with the licentiate Juan de Vidio, a negro belonging to Juan de Cespedes, seeing these bowels, and thinking they were really sausages, would have eaten them if they had not been hard and dry from time and smoke. Outside the houses they have many heads placed in rows, entire legs, arms, and other parts of bodies, in such abundance as to be hardly credible. If I had not myself seen what I write, and did not know that there are now many people in Spain who have also seen it, I would not venture to state that these men are such butchers of other men for the sole purpose of eating them, but we know for certain that these Garonas are great butchers in the matter of eating human flesh. They have no idols, nor did I see any house of worship, but it is publicly known that some of them converse with the devil. Neither priests nor friars have gone amongst them, as they have in Peru and other parts of the Indies, for fear of being killed. These Indians are separated from the valley of the great river by a distance of two or three leagues, but they go down to fish in the great river and in the lagoons, returning with great store of fish. They are of middling stature, and fit for little work. I only saw the men wearing cloths, but the women are dressed in large cotton mantles. Their dead are wrapped in many of these mantles, which are about three yards long and two broad, and fastened by cords. Between the mantles they put golden ornaments, and then bury the bodies in deep tombs. This province is within the jurisdiction of the city of Cali. In the ravine of the river there is a village, which is not very large, owing to the wars which have destroyed the population. Near it there is a great lake formed by the overflow of the river, but which is drained when the river is low. In this lake the Indians kill a vast quantity of very savory fish, which they give to travelers, and with which they trade in the cities of Cartago and Cali, and in other parts. Besides the quantity they thus dispose of, or eat themselves, they have great deposits for sale to the Indians of the mountains, and great jars of grease taken from the fish. When we were engaged in exploring with the licentiate Juan de Vidio, we arrived at this village very short of food, and found some fish. Afterwards, when we came to found the town of Anzerma with Captain Robledo, we found enough fish here to load two ships. This province of the Garonas is very fertile, and yields plenty of maize and other things. There are many deer, guataquanajes, other wild beasts, and birds in the woods. But the great valley of Cali, once so fertile, is now a desert of grassy land, yielding no profit to any but the deer and other animals who graze in it, for the Christians are not in sufficient numbers to occupy such extensive tracts. Chapter 27. Of the situation of the city of Cali, of the Indians in its vicinity, and concerning the founder. To reach the city of Cali it is necessary to cross a small river called the Rio Frio, which is full of weeds and flags. This river is very cold, because it comes down from the mountains, and, flowing through a part of the valley, loses itself in the great river. Beyond this river the road leads over extensive plains, where there are many small and very fleet deer. The Spaniards have their grazing farms in the plains, where their servants live, and look after the estates. The Indians come from their villages in the mountains to sow and reap the maize in the plains. Near the farms many very pretty watercourses flow through and irrigate the fields, besides some small rivers of good water. Many orange, lime, lemon, pomegranate and banana trees have been planted along these rivers and watercourses, besides excellent sugar canes. There are also pineapples, guayabas, guavas, guanavanas, paltas, and other fruits in great abundance. There are Spanish melons and legumes, but wheat has not yet been introduced, though I am told they have it in the valley of Lyle, which is five leagues from the city, neither have they planted vines as yet, though the land is as well adapted for them as that of Spain. The city of Cali is situated a league from the great river, near a small river of particularly good water, which rises in the overhanging mountains. 
Its banks are bordered with pleasant gardens, where there are plenty of the fruits and vegetables just mentioned. The city is built on a level platform, and, if it was not for the heat, it would be one of the best sights I have seen in any part of the Indies, for it wants nothing to make it excellent. The Indians and caciques who serve the Spaniards holding encomiendas live in the mountains. When I left the place there were 23 citizens who had Indians, and there are never wanting Spaniards who are traveling from one part to the other, looking after their affairs. This city of Cali was founded by Captain Miguel Munoz in the name of His Majesty, the Adelantado Don Francisco Pizarro being governor of Peru, in the year 1537, though, as I said before, it was first founded by the Captain Sebastian de Belalcazar in the country of the Garonas. And some say that the municipality of the city obliged Miguel Munoz to remove the settlement to its present site, whence it appears that the honor of founding the city is in dispute between Belalcazar and the municipality, for the conquerors, who composed the citizens, declare that it was not known whether Miguel Munoz acted of his own accord or not. Chapter 28. Of the villages and chiefs of Indians who are within the jurisdiction of this city of Cali. On the western side of this city, towards the mountains, there are many villages of Indians, who are very docile, a simple people void of malice. Amongst these villages there is a small valley closed in by mountains. The valley is level, and is always sown with maize and yucas, besides having plantations of fruit trees, and of the palms called pixinares. The houses in this valley are very large, round, lofty, and supported on straight poles. There were six chiefs when I entered this valley, who were held in small estimation by the Indians, many of whom are always in the houses of Spaniards. Through the center of this valley, which is called Lyle, a river flows, and is fed by many streams coming from the mountains. The banks of this river are well covered with fruit trees, amongst which there is one which is very delicious and fragrant called Granadilla. Near this valley there was a village, the chief of which was the most powerful and respected of all the chiefs of the neighborhood. His name was Pitacui. In the center of his village there was a great and lofty round wooden house, with a door in the center. The light was admitted by four windows in the upper part, and the roof was of straw. As one entered through the door, there was a long board stretching from one end of the house to the other, on which many human bodies were placed in rows, being those of men who had been defeated and taken in war. They were all cut open, and this is done with stone knives, after which they eat the flesh, stuff the skins with ashes, and place them on the board in such sort as to appear like living men. In the hands of some they place lances, and in those of others darts or clubs. Besides these bodies, there is a great abundance of arms and legs collected together in the great house, insomuch that it was fearful to see them, thus contemplating so sad a spectacle, and reflecting that all had been killed and eaten by their neighbors as if they had been beasts of the field. But these Indians gloried in the sight, saying that their fathers and ancestors taught them to act thus. Not content with natural food, they turn their bellies into the tombs of their neighbors. But now they do not eat human flesh as they used to do, the Spirit of Heaven has shone upon them, they have come to a knowledge of their blindness, and many of them have become Christians. There is hope that more will turn to our holy faith day by day, with the help and mediation of God our Redeemer and Lord. An Indian, native of a village called Viaque, in this province, formerly in the repartimiento of the Captain Don Jorge Robledo, when I asked him why they had such a number of dead bodies in this house, replied that it was to show the grandeur of the Lord of the Valley, and that not only was it the custom to preserve the bodies, but also to collect the arms of enemies, and hang them to the beams of the house as memorials. He also said that when the people were asleep the devil often entered into the bodies which were stuffed with ashes, and assumed so fearful and terrible a form that some persons died of mere terror. The dead Indians, whose bodies this Lord preserved as trophies, in the manner already described, were mostly natives of the wide valley of Cali, for, as I have stated before, there were villages containing thousands of Indians in that valley, who never ceased to wage war with those of the mountains, nor, during most of their time, did they ever think of anything else. These Indians have no other arms than those which are used by their neighbors. They generally go naked, though now most of them have shirts and mantles of cotton, and their women also wear cotton clothes. Both men and women have their noses pierced, and wear a sort of twisted nails in them of gold, about the thickness of a finger, called caricuras. They also wear necklaces of fine gold, rarely worked, and earrings of twisted gold. Their former dress consisted of a small cloth in front, and another over the shoulders, the women covering themselves from the waist downwards with a cotton mantle. When their chiefs die, they make large and deep tombs inside their houses, into which they put a good supply of food, arms, and gold, with the bodies. They have no religion whatever, so far as we could understand, nor did we see any house of worship. When any of them fell sick, they bathed, and for some illnesses they use certain herbs, the virtue whereof cures them. It is a public and well-known fact that those who are chosen by the devil converse with him. 
I have not heard that either these Indians, or those we have left behind, practice the abominable crime, but if, by the advice of the devil, any Indian commits this crime, it is thought little of, and they call him a woman. They marry their nieces, and some chiefs marry their sisters. The son of the principal wife inherits the chiefship and property of the father. Some of them are magicians, and above all they are very dirty. Beyond this village, of which Pitakui was chief, there are many others, the natives of which are all friends and allies. These villages are short distances from each other. The houses are large and round, with roofs of straw. Their customs are the same as those of the Indians I have already described. At first they entered into a war with the Spaniards, and underwent severe punishment, insomuch that they have never rebelled since. They have now taken more to Christianity than any of the other tribes, go dressed in shirts, and serve those who have become their masters with good will. Beyond this province, towards the south, there is another called Timbas, in which there are three or four chiefs. It is situated amongst rugged mountains containing some valleys where they have their villages, and the land is well covered with crops, fruit trees, palms, and other things. Their arms are darts and lances. They have been much addicted to the invasion and subjection of their neighbors, and they are not yet entirely tamed, being established in a very inaccessible country. Being warlike and valiant, they have killed many Spaniards, and done much harm. Their customs and language differ but slightly from the others. Further on there are other tribes which extend as far as the sea, all having the same language and customs. Chapter 29. In which the matter relating to the city of Cali is concluded, and concerning other Indians inhabiting the mountains near the port which they call Buenaventura. Besides these provinces, there are many other Indian tribes under the jurisdiction of the city of Cali, who dwell in the most rugged and inaccessible mountains in the world. Amongst these wilds there are some valleys which are very fertile, and which yield all manner of fruit. There are also many wild animals, especially great tigers, which kill many Indians and Spaniards who go to, and come from the sea coast, every day. The houses of the Indians in these mountains are rather small, and roofed with leaves of palm trees, of which there are many in the forests. These houses are surrounded by stout and very long poles forming a wall, which are put up as a defense against the tigers. The arms, dress, and customs of these Indians are neither more nor less than those of the Valley of Lyle and their language leaves me under the impression that they are the same people. They are strong and powerful men. They have always been at peace from the time that they declared their allegiance to His Majesty, and are very friendly to the Spaniards, so that, although Christians are always passing through their villages, they have not killed nor harmed any up to the present time, on the contrary, as soon as they see them, they give them food to eat. The port of Buenaventura is three days' journey from the villages of these Indians, all the way through thickets of palm trees, and rocky broken-up country, and is thirty leagues from the city of Cali. I shall not give a chapter on this port, because I have nothing more to say of it than that it was founded by Juan Ladrillo under the direction of the Adelantado Don Pascual de Andagoya, and that afterwards it was abandoned, owing to the absence of this Andagoya, arising from disputes between him and the Adelantado Balalcazar respecting the boundaries of their governments. Finally, Balalcazar took Andagoya, and sent him prisoner to Spain. Then the Cabildo of Cali arranged that six or seven of the citizens should always reside in the port, in order that, when the ships arrived from New Spain and Nicaragua, they might see that the merchandise was landed, and provide houses to receive it. These residents are paid at the cost of the merchants, and among them there is a captain who has no power to pronounce judgments, but only to hear cases and forward them to the city of Cali for decision. These remarks seem sufficient to give the reader a knowledge of how the port of Buenaventura was first established. The only means of conveying merchandise from the port to the city of Cali is by the aid of the Indians of the intervening mountains, whose ordinary work is to carry it on their backs, for it is impossible to transport it in any other way. If it was desired to make a road, I believe that laden beasts could not pass over it on account of the ruggedness of the mountains. It is true that there is another way, practicable for horses and cattle, by the river of Dagua, but they pass it in constant peril, and many die by the way, while the rest arrive in such sorry condition that they are of no use for many days. When a ship arrives at the port, the chiefs presently send down as many Indians as they can, according to the capacity of their villages, and these porters come up by roads and passes with loads weighing three arabas and more, and some of them carry men or women, even when they are stout, in chairs made of the bark of trees. In this way they journey with their loads, without showing fatigue, and without being overworked. If they should receive any pay, they would go off to their homes, but all that these poor fellows gain is taken by the encomenderos, though, in truth, they pay little tribute. It is said that they come and go willingly, but they in reality undergo great labor. When they come into the plain, and approach the city of Cali, they go along painfully. I have heard the Indians of New Spain highly praised for the great loads they carry, but these people between Cali and Buenaventura astonish me, 
and if I had not seen it, and traversed the mountains where they have their villages, I could neither believe nor affirm it. Beyond these Indians there are other lands inhabited by warlike tribes, and the river of San Juan, which is marvelously rich, flows through them. These people have their houses fastened in trees. There are many other rivers, all rich in gold, the banks of which are inhabited by Indians, but they cannot be conquered because the land is covered with forests which are impenetrable, nor can the rivers be crossed without boats. The houses are very large, for each one contains twenty or thirty inhabitants. Amidst these rivers there was a Christian settlement founded, but I will say little concerning it because it lasted only a short time. The natives killed one Pio Romero, who was there as the lieutenant of the Adelantado Andagoya, for he had received all these rivers from his majesty, with the title of governor of the river of San Juan. The Indians deceitfully enticed Pio Romero, and other Christians, onto a river in canoes, saying that they wanted to give them plenty of gold, and soon so many Indians assembled that they killed all the Spaniards, but they took Pio Romero alive, inflicting cruel torments upon him, and slicing off his members till he died. They also took two or three women alive, and dealt very cruelly with them. Some of the Christians, by great good luck, escaped from the cruelty of the Indians. No further attempt was made to establish this village, for that land is evil. I will now relate what there is between the city of Cali and that of Papayan. Chapter 30. In which the road is described from the city of Cali to that of Papayan, and concerning the villages of Indians that lie between them. The distance from the city of Cali to the city of Papayan is twenty-two leagues, over a good level road without any forest, although there are some zigzag ascents, but they are not rugged nor difficult, like those we have left behind. Leaving, then, the city of Cali, the road passes through meadows and plains watered by rivers, until one is reached, which is not very large, called Zamandi, spanned by a bridge of stout canes. He who has a horse crosses by a ford without any danger. Near the source of this river there are Indians whose district, also called Zamandi, extends over three or four leagues. The district and river take their name from that of a chief. These Indians trade with those of the province of Timbas, and they collect much gold, which they have supplied in great quantity to those who hold them in encomienda. Five leagues further on, in the same road to Papayan, is the great river of Santa Martha, where there are always balsas and canoes, so that it can be crossed without danger, and thus the Indian inhabitants go and come from one city to the other. The banks of this river were once very populous, but the people have been extirpated by time and by the war which they waged with the captain Balalcazar, who was the first to discover and conquer them. Although he was one cause of their rapid destruction, yet another cause of it was their evil custom and accursed vice of eating each other. The remains of these tribes and nations consist of a diminished race on both banks of the river, who are called Aguales, and who are subject to the city of Cali. There are, however, many Indians in the mountains on each side, who, on account of the difficulty in penetrating their country, and of the troubles in Peru, have not yet been subjugated. Concealed and isolated as they are, they have yet been seen by the invincible Spaniards, and defeated many times. They all go naked, and have the same customs as their neighbors. After crossing the great river, which is fourteen leagues from the city of Papayan, there is a morass about a quarter of a league in extent, and beyond it the road is very good, until the river called Ovejas is reached. There is much risk to him who attempts to cross this river in the winter time, for it is very deep, and the ford is near its mouth, where it falls into the great river. Many Spaniards and Indians have been drowned here. On the other side of this river there is a smooth plain, six leagues in extent, and very good for traveling, and at the end of it a river called Piandamo is crossed. Its banks, and the whole of this plain, were once well peopled, but those whom the fury of the war has spared, have retired to a distance from the road, where they think they are safer. To the eastward is the province of Gambia, and many other chiefs and villages. Beyond the river of Piandamo, there is another called Plaza, the banks of which are well peopled, both at its sources, and all along its course. Then the great river is again crossed by a ford, and from this point to Papayan the whole country is covered with beautiful farms, such as in Spain we call Alcarias or Cortijos, and here the Spaniards have their flocks. These plains are also sown with maize, and it is here that they have begun to sow wheat. The land will yield great quantities, for it is well suited to its growths. In other parts of this country they reap the maize in five or six months, so that they have two crops in the year. They, however, only sow it once in the year on this plain, and their harvest is in May and June, that of wheat in July and August, as in Spain. All these meadows and plains were once very populous, and subject to the lord whose name was Papayan, one of the principal chiefs in these provinces. Now there are few Indians, owing to the war with the Spaniards, and to their custom of eating each other, and also to the great famine, which was caused by their not sowing the crops, with the hope that, there being no food, the Spaniards would leave their country. There are many fruit trees, 
especially aguacatas or pears, which are abundant and savory. The rivers rising in the Cordillera of the Andes flow through these plains, and the water is very limpid and sweet. In some of them there are signs of gold. The site of the city is on a high table land, in an excellent situation, being the healthiest and most temperate of any in the government of Papayan, and even in the greater part of the kingdom of Peru. Truly the climate is more like Spain than the Andes. There are large houses of straw in the city. This city of Papayan is the chief and head of all the cities I have described, except that of Yoruba, which belongs to the government of Carthagena. All the rest are under Papayan, which contains a cathedral church, and, as this is the principal and most central city, the government is entitled Papayan. To the east is the long chain of the Andes, to the west are other mountains which overhang the South Sea, and on the other side are the plains which I have described. The city of Papayan was founded by the Captain Don Sebastian de Balalcazar, in the name of the Emperor Charles, our Lord, by authority of the Adelantado Don Francisco Pizarro, Governor of all Peru, for His Majesty, in the year of the Lord 1536.